Hey folks, welcome into the News 12 Now desk. Thanks for uh, joining us here on this Tuesday, August 1st. We have made it here to August now. Kind of crazy to think about. Uh, summer break winding down for a lot of our local students if they haven't already gone back to school. I know a lot have on the South Carolina side. Uh, we are uh, taking a look at our top headlines first, though. A couple things to hit on. Weather's looking pretty good today. We saw some rain in some places early on, but right now, uh, skies are looking blue, roads are looking clear, so you shouldn't have any issues out there. And then want to remind you guys, of course, to uh, download our WRDW streaming app. You can do that on your Roku, Fire Stick, Apple TV, whatever your favorite streaming device is. And then also subscribe to our YouTube channel, which I'll show you how to do real quick. Uh, if you're here on YouTube, you just go to WRDW News 12. And there we are, our top headlines that's live right now. And then you can see here our channel. Uh, and then there's a couple other things I just wanted to show you real quick. We've started two new uh, segments. We've got this video vault right here uh, going back to school in the COVID era. So uh, what that is, is every Monday we'll take a little look back in time, kind of a this week in history type thing uh, where we're going to go back and look at some old stories from this week. It was July 31st to August 4th. Uh, throughout the years. And so we talked about uh, going back to school during COVID. I brought on a, a woman who was at Evans at the time uh, and now works for Columbia Virtual Academy. So we talked about that as well. We also hit on the Miller Theater reopening. Uh, we did a big story on that uh, five years ago, I think this week, six years ago this week. Uh, and then we also talked about Sammy Sias investigation that happened uh, a few years ago now, four years ago. So that was happening. And then also we have um, a new live weather show that we're going to be doing every day called First Alert Weather Extra. So that is going to be happening every day about 1030 here on the streaming app and YouTube channel. And that's just weather from across the area and across the country and across the world. If there's big weather stories going on worldwide. So uh, we're super excited to bring those to you. Those will be happening daily and weekly. Um, and so we'll have those up on the streaming apps. But OK. Let's get into uh, the news now, some of our top headlines. Two days left now until students are back in the classroom in Columbia County and changes are on the way when it comes to school safety. That is our top story this morning as schools get ready to head back this week in Columbia and Richmond County schools. Then on the top of parents mind, of course, it's always safety. Nick Veland stopped by our open house uh, at Columbia County schools yesterday where he learned the district's new police department in Columbia County has plans to add more school resource officers. <laughs> summer winding down. Teachers like Dr. Kathleen Barbara are getting ready for week number one. A lot of role play, a lot of dialogue, preparing the syllabus further, preparing the first week's assignments. And that's not the only thing getting edited over the summer. The Columbia County School District Police hired more school resource officers. Every high school parking lot will now have a dedicated SRO. That's on top of two resource officers for high school. Elementary and middle will still have one, so teachers and students can focus on learning. And I'm excited to have everybody back here daily in the classroom um, learning in front of a teacher. First year principal Juliet King spent the summer making sure her school is ready to go. We are clean, we're inspired, our teachers have been working very hard to create engaging lessons uh, to inspire students as uh, we motivate them to uh, be lifelong learners. Murals over here from some of the IB students a few years back. All to make parents and students ready for the year ahead. <laughs> Getting back to a routine, waking up early in the morning um, and having that, that set schedule, just hitting it hard again. And you might want to start studying if you have Dr. Barbara. Getting ready for our first test, which will be at the end of next week. That's a little cruel having to test that early on in the year, but uh, hopefully it's just a little, you know, nice to meet you quick uh, refresher type test, but who knows? Columbia County and Richmond County elementary schools have their open houses uh, tomorrow. Richmond County Middle and High School, no, excuse me, today, uh, Richmond County Middle and High School will have theirs on Wednesday. Again, Columbia and Richmond County Elementary have theirs today. Uh, Richmond County Middle and High have theirs on Wednesday, tomorrow. Okay. The Columbia County Sheriff's Office, uh, we, quick update to this story. Actually, they did find this guy this man who was uh, wanted for something suspicious at a Kroger on Lewis and Road. He allegedly tried to walk off with a seven year old uh, telling the child's mother or the child's mother says she heard him say, tell your mom bye." the um, he, again, he was seen. I'm just trying to pull up the uh, update that we just got on this. Just give me one second here. I believe they found him. Uh, they said he suffers from a cognitive disability. 
and they were working with him and his family. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, the sheriff's office posted this a minute ago uh, saying, let me take down the graphic. Come on. Okay. Posted this a little bit ago saying they've located and identified the man in the photo. They've learned he suffers from a medical condition affecting his cognitive abilities. They're working with the family and at this time, no charges will be made. So we'll continue to follow up on that, let you know if anything changes there. Uh, but that is directly from the Columbia County Sheriff's Facebook page. So we'll let you know if we get any updates. The first responder was arrested earlier this month, or last month rather, accused of sexually assaulting a woman. The Aiken County Sheriff's Office says Jeremy Gray responded to a woman's 911 call back on July 5th. She told deputies Gray arrived and began to sexually assault her. The report says he left, then came back later, getting her phone number and exposing himself in the kitchen. Gray was arrested, but has since been released. The Augusta University professor charged with public indecency has retired. That happened back on July 10th. Investigators say John Sleeger was caught exposing and touching himself in a math lounge at AU. He was arrested July 16th and placed on administrative leave the next day. The professor was an employee since 1990 and he submitted his uh, retirement paperwork last week. Five people have now been charged in the death of John Belote after his remains were found in Windsor. Deputies arrested Suzanne Boozer Friday and charged her with accessory after the fact for murder. She's in jail with a bond set at $15,000. She joins Thomas Gwynn, Donald Britton, and Cody Wooten in jail. Uh, they all face charges in connection to the removal of human remains. Now, there is a fifth suspect, Michael Williams Jr., who's still wanted. If you have any information on where he may be, you are asked to call the Aiken County Sheriff's Office. Burke County Sheriff Alfonso Williams met with two county commissioners yesterday afternoon to talk about his department's financial situation. We've reported on that uh, and those stories you can find up on the website. After uh, two and a half hours of conversation, no definite solutions is what we've been told. The county manager says no commitments were made. Sheriff Williams will attend the next budget work session to talk to the full commission since three of them were not able to make it to yesterday's meeting. There was nothing released about the sheriff's office running out of money in two weeks and still not clear what's going to happen. But of course, we will keep you updated as soon as we hear more information there. The Richmond County school system is setting their sights on building two new schools and they're seeing a lot more student growth in some parts of the county. A tale of two different sides of the county since they recently closed two other schools because of underpopulation. So the new K through five school is going to be built next to Richmond Hill at the old Rollins Elementary school, uh, school site. The new middle school is going in the Fort Gordon area just down the street from Sue Reynolds Elementary School on Wrightsboro Road. So how much will it cost these schools to make and how long will they take to build? Craig Allison has a closer look. That's right, y'all. It's $30 million for a new elementary school right next to Richmond Hill and more than $36 million for a new middle school right next to Bel Air here. Now, while both of these schools have been open less than six years, they're saying that there's lots of popularity. One parent I talked to just across the street that just moved in says that she was afraid that her kid might not get in because of how popular this school is. It's a growing community of parents and military families that Selena Jones is a part of. We were worried because, you know, coming back from COVID and everything, but the school's been great. After moving in almost two years ago, one of her kids just completed first grade here at Bel Air. A great system, she says, taught her daughter how to read in four months, but originally she was worried about getting her kid in. Because over here is all new housing, and it becomes a question like, oh, do we go to this school or do we go to the one on base? And so thankfully we were able to go to this one because it's five feet away. <laughs> in less than six years, the school jumped dramatically from 925 students in 2018 to almost 1,050 kids now. It's a similar situation at Richmond Hill, where their population has seen steady growth from their starting 921 in 2019 to almost 1,200. A new elementary school under construction next door to Richmond Hill hopes to solve that, as well as a new middle school less than 10 minutes away from Bel Air. And Miss Jones couldn't be more excited for her family. I think it's really cool because it just means more kids for my kids to play with um, and also like seeing the growth and community being built over here in kind of like a like away from like the more city area. 
Now that timeline for both is expected to take a little less than two years for Richmond Hills Elementary School neighbor. That's looking like June of 2025 just about now for Bel Air's middle school neighbor. We're still waiting for that construction to officially kick off, but we'll keep you updated on that. OK, thanks for that, Craig. Yesterday marked a big milestone for not only Georgia, but the entire country when it comes to nuclear power. Unit 3 at Plant Vogel is now operational and its power is being used to serve customers. This is some video of the new plant courtesy of Georgia Power. Despite the delays and cost overruns, this is the first nuclear plant or unit in the nation in more than 30 years. Across the country, there are now 92 nuclear reactors that power millions of homes and businesses. Taylor Martin explains how this will impact your Georgia Power bill. Georgia Power says clean energy source from plant Vogel units three and four means zero air pollution. While it may be a solution for cleaner air, better air quality is about to have you digging through your wallet. According to Georgia Power, the operation of unit three will add an estimated $5.42 per month or 3.2% increase to the typical residential customer's monthly bill using an average of 1,000 kilowatts per hour per month. Just under $6 on top of your monthly bill that might already be rising as a result of the summer heat. Despite the increase, Georgia Power says plant Vogel units are economical and will serve the state of Georgia for six to eight decades. In an email, they say Georgia Power knows that energy is an important part of the budget for every family. Throughout the construction of the new Vogel units, we have worked to minimize the impact of the project on customer rates and continue to do so. They also say any additional increase to rates moving forward will be determined by the Public Service Commission. Thanks for that, Taylor. Now there is one more unit to go, and Georgia Power says they expect it to be fully operational either late this year or early next year. So we'll keep up with that and let you know when it's ready. It's been a year since investigators found the body of Freddie Powell charred and burned off Boggy Gut Road in Aiken. His family says they're still without answers as to who killed their son. And their case isn't the only open murder case. Crystal Anderson went missing last August in Aiken County. Her alleged kidnappers behind bars, but her body is nowhere to be found. Freddie's family sat down with our Hallie Turner, hoping to bring new leads to this unsolved case. It's just a dark cloud over my life, my family's life, and the only way that I think that dark, dark cloud is going to leave is we get some answers. Portia Powell says her brother's life was anything but trouble. His everyday life, like I say, he, he was working two jobs. He was working at Applebee's. He was working at um, Waffle House. He's no game banger or no, you know, he don't get in trouble or nothing. So it's just weird for anybody to do anything to him. Family gatherings are now replaced by fear when her brother's body was found burned. Same time, it was hard because it was just like we was reliving that life that, you know, that day all over again. The community knows, somebody knows what happened and nobody's talking, but it's just so hard to live regular because you don't know who to trust. As the case remains open, calls from investigators have grown quiet over the last year. I really don't think they're working on it. I don't look around to try to get answers or my family try to get answers from, you know, from the streets. We're never going to get it. As questions from her children grow louder. They ask me all the time. They got answers. Mom, did they find out who did it, Mom? You know, like they want to know too. Did they ever going to find out, Mom, who did that? It's my uncle. And she's putting the fight to find justice for Trey and so many other unsolved cases like Crystal Anderson in Aiken County on the community. We work with each other to try to help solve these cases, you know, because it's hard on all the families that have lost somebody. It's not right. She didn't deserve that. My brother didn't deserve that. A lot of people didn't deserve it. In Aiken, Hallie Turner on your side. We did reach out to Aiken County investigators about any new leads and how they dive deeper into these cases as time passes. And we'll let you know when we hear something from them. Brushing your teeth, the hot meal, clean, hot showers, it's a necessity for most we may take for granted. Some people don't have access to these luxuries. Now, as Audrey Dick Herber reports, there's a growing push to help find a solution. Buses drive people off right here to have access to a variety of resources such as food, water, haircuts, and even a shower, all for free. It's the start of a solution to an ongoing problem. People are hurting, they really are. People are struggling financially, physically, mentally, all of those types of things right now. An opportunity for free resources for those in need. I had someone in line at 7 a.m. this morning. I mean, that goes to show you, we have seen 
I would say well over 100 people today. With a way to get there and back. To provide free consultation to some people who will see these people as have fallen through the cracks, but they haven't. So we are here to show that we can be a community partner and allow everyone to access these resources that may put them on the path to empowerment. People had access to many resources, all for free. You know, a woman got off the bus and she actually it was the shirts that I had just folded. She had picked up a shirt and a pair of pants that I had just folded and got her shower, got something to eat, got some resources, fresh clothing and a haircut. Boom, that's just magic. And this type of event is really needed. What we're seeing is an increase in the amount of services that we are providing, which tells us that the need is, is increasing. But events like this aren't over. And it's not our responsibility to look at them as burdens. It's our responsibility to look at people as the people that they are, as human beings, and try to help from a place of empathy. Since the need is so great, the goal is to have an event like this once a month or once every other month. Audrey Dickerber, on your side. All right, thanks for that update there, Audrey. North Augusta's new recycling facility is open, and with it come some new changes. Recycling day is going to happen every two weeks. Homes scheduled for collection are depending on whether you have a blue or a green week. To find out which one you're on, take a look at the sticker on the tote. Paper, plastic, glass, and metal materials should be clean, dry, and loose. No garbage bags, yard waste, or electronics will be collected. Yesterday, Aiken Technical College's School of Nursing held a pinning ceremony. This is to recognize its summer graduates as they enter the workforce. Graduates recited the Florence Nightingale Pledge, that's known as the Nurse's Oath. Then they got a pin to signify their commitment to serving others. Dr. Hannah Williams, the Dean of Nursing at Aiken Tech, says these students are entering a workforce in dire need. Because we have another set of students who are going to go out into the nursing profession or PCT profession to help meet the shortage that we know in healthcare that we're all facing. I know in both Aiken and Augusta area that almost each hospital or you know clinical facility is facing some sort of shortage when it comes to nursing or you know professional staff. Congratulations to all those grads, and as Dr. Williams says, they are entering a much-needed workforce. Let's move on to some statewide news here in Georgia. A rare infection confirmed in Georgia, putting many on edge. Last week, the Georgia Department of Health announced that somebody in the state died from a brain-eating amoeba. Just in yesterday, AU confirmed that case did happen here locally. This is the second death in the U.S. from this infection in just the past week. But as Joshua Skinner explains, that does not mean it's time to panic. Over the past week here in America, two people have died from a freshwater brain eating amoeba. But despite that, it's still an extremely rare infection that shouldn't keep you out of the water. The first death happened in Nevada, the second here in Georgia. The last time that we ever had an infection like this in an, in an individual was 21 years ago. Sherry Drenzik monitors infectious diseases for the state of Georgia. She knows all about the amoeba known as Megleria fowleri. It's a single cell organism that lives in freshwater ponds, lakes, and rivers, often resting in the sediment. It infects humans by entering the brain through the nose. Most Negleria fowleri infections are associated with swimming in warm, fresh bodies of water. The infection has been found in 22 states, as far west as California and as far north as Minnesota. It is almost always fatal but that doesn't mean you should avoid kayaking or wading in the water. It is not found in salt water. It is not found in oceans. The risk is below low. There are only six confirmed cases in Georgia during the past 60 years and 160 throughout the entire country. According to the CDC, early symptoms include headache, fever, and nausea, eventually progressing to confusion, seizures, and death. The most important thing you can do is try to limit the amount of water that gets in your nose. If you want to take extra precautions, Drenzik says don't dive into the water and avoid places where you might kick up sediment. Otherwise, don't let the small risk ruin your good time. The risk indeed is extremely low. There you go. Low risk. Don't let it ruin the time. But Georgia Department of Health did not specify and AU only uh, confirmed that the case was local. We're working to uncover where this local victim may have caught the infection, whether it was here or elsewhere. 
Keeping it in Georgia here, the future is now for kids who want to be their own bosses. In Atlanta, a group of kids hoping to become the city's newest entrepreneurs presented their business plans. Just think of it as a shark tank for kids. As Sawyer Bussy reports, thousands of dollars are on the line. If you think contestants on Shark Tank are impressive. I've been practicing, I've been paying attention when the speakers have been talking all week. You would love watching these kids do their thing. After that, later down the line, I created my kids vitamin that has vitamins A, B, C, and D. We want to encourage and empower girls by teaching them the proper education for their period. We are reinforcing proper education, period. These nine entrepreneurs are trying to prove their business worthy of thousands of dollars in grant money. These kids are inside right now pitching their hearts out. What they don't know is that they're all walking away winners. Actually, they, what the kids believe is that they're pitching for $5,000 in grants. And so they believe that's gonna be one winner. So everyone is going to get a $2,500 check and then we have a grand prize winner that's gonna get $5,000. They've been working all week, listening to speakers in the community, working with mentors and getting ready for their pitch in front of the judges. My first product, my book, Lemons to Lemonade, that talks about how I changed a negative situation into a positive one. This is all the work of Youth Mean Business, a new organization created to jumpstart young entrepreneurs by providing mentors, connections, and yes, capital. It's more than just, you know, putting our words. We have to put the money behind our words. There are a lot of programs for kids to encourage them to start businesses, and a lot of kids do want to do that. But once they start, they're kind of on their own. Our goal is to help bridge that gap. In Atlanta, saw your bussy at Lennon News First. Really great program there, helping out a lot of kids start their dream up a little bit. And keep in mind, these students are all ages 11 to 17, so really the future uh, of business there in Atlanta, hopefully. And if they're doing this now, imagine what they'll be able to accomplish later. A 24-year-old has died after what's being described as a freak accident in Atlanta. Thomas Milner jumped into Lake Lanier from his family's dock Thursday, but he was electrocuted in the water. Police say neighbors took a boat out to try and help. One person even jumped in the water to pull Milner out, but reported feeling a burning sensation, which they realized is an electric shock. A freak accident. Normally, power's grounded, but sometimes there's a loose wire doesn't take much, you know, if it's near the voltage, where the voltage comes into the dock, water's kind of, you know, full of electricity. Milner died from his injuries Friday. According to the family, the dock is less than three years old, and they did use a licensed electrician. The investigation into how the water became electrified is ongoing. Across the river now in South Carolina, families can get some back to school savings soon with the state's annual tax free weekend coming up. It runs from Friday to Sunday and certain items are exempt from South Carolina's 6% sales tax and local taxes. State House reporter Mary Green has the details. South Carolina Department of Revenue says last year shoppers bought more than 26 million dollars worth of tax free items during the state's tax free weekend. We asked the experts how to maximize these benefits this year. If you can only purchase what you need specifically for that moment, because there's a real possibility that if you don't need it specifically for back to school, it's going to be on sale again for Thanksgiving, Black Friday. These are some examples of what's exempt. In general, it's items like supplies used for school assignments, electronics, clothing and shoes, and bed and bath items, new or used. On the flip side, here are some examples of what's not exempt this weekend, including rented clothing and shoes, items used in a business or trade, and items placed on layaway or deferred payment plans. The cost of school supplies has gone up nearly 25% in the last two years, according to the Consumer Price Index, and the outlook is mixed on how this could affect American spending this year. The National Retail Federation projects Americans will spend a record $41.5 billion on back to school shopping this year, while a survey from Deloitte predicts this spending could decrease for the first time in nearly a decade. I think it's likely we'll see more spending this year just because prices have gone up. So everything is more expensive and so that's going to lead to higher total sales volume. But at the same time, because things are more expensive, consumers are really going to be looking for a bargain in a way that they haven't 
over the last two years. Von Nessen and Watson say the tax free weekend is enough to add up to some sizable savings, especially when paired up with other discounts at stores. But Watson also cautions that some stores will also raise their prices to make up for any discounts. So with anything else, it pays to do your homework on back to school shopping. Reporting Columbia, I'm Mary Green. OK, thanks for that, Mary. And for South Carolinians who'd rather avoid the crowds in stores and shop online, eligible items are still tax free if purchased online as well. Today, a judge will decide whether a woman facing charges related to a deadly crash on Folly Beach will stay behind bars ahead of her trial. Jamie Komorowski's bond hearing is set for August 1st today. She faces several charges, including felony DUI and reckless homicide for the deadly crash that killed newlywed Samantha Miller back in April. Komorowski's lawyers claim she's not a flight risk and is no danger to the public. They also state she struggles with alcohol dependence and would enter rehab if she's released on bond. The property manager of Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate made his first court appearance yesterday in the classified documents case against the former president. Christian Benavidez was in the courtroom in Miami. Carlos de Oliveira faces charges including conspiracy to obstruct justice and lying to investigators. He did not answer questions before or after the brief hearing Monday morning in Miami. Prosecutors say de Oliveira conspired with Trump and Trump aide Walt Nauta to try to delete security footage while investigators were looking into the former president's handling of classified documents. The Justice Department has unfortunately decided to bring these charges against Mr. de Oliveira. Keep moving. 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 Keep Christian Benavides, CBS News, Miami. The judge offered the defendant to turn over his passport and sign an agreement to pay $100,000 if he does not appear in court. Arraignment is scheduled for August 10th in Fort Pierce, Florida. Meanwhile, former President Trump is facing the mounting legal woes, but he's still leading the pack in the race to win the Republican presidential nomination. A New York Times and Siena poll of likely Republican voters shows Trump's lead over his GOP rivals has grown even after being indicted. Trump's at 54 percent, followed by Florida Governor Ron DeSantis at 17 percent. Everybody else three or below. Trump's challengers are calling the legal cases a distraction. You're not going to be able to bring the administrative state to heel, to slay the deep state, to do all this if you have distractions, uh, if you're not focused. CBS News has confirmed that a pro-Trump political action committee has spent more than $40 million on legal expenses for Trump this year. The House Oversight Committee is holding a closed-door interview with Devon Archer and House Oversight investigators. Archer is the former business partner of Hunter Biden, the president's son. The House Oversight Committee is investigating the Biden family and if President Biden had any involvement or influence in his son's business dealings. Delta Airlines is facing a $2 million lawsuit after a man on a plane was allegedly served at least 10 vodka drinks and a glass of wine before groping a 16-year-old. That happened during an international flight last summer. The suit claims the flight attendants ignored a mother's pleas for them to stop serving alcohol to the man and that the passenger was making them feel unsafe. The plaintiffs in the case say during the nine-hour flight from New York to Greece, the man made obscene gestures and sexually assaulted the 16-year-old girl sitting next to him. When that plane landed in Greece, the man was allegedly allowed to walk free, despite the mother's request that authorities arrest him in Athens. Concern grows with each passing day after an American and her child were kidnapped in Haiti. The two were taken from campus of a Christian ministry where the woman served as a nurse. At this hour, no word on where they are, who has them, or any ransom demands. Laura Aguirre has more on urgent efforts by the U.S. to find them. She was definitely um, a very special young woman. The president of kidnapped American Alex Dorsonville's former college, recalling Dorsonville's passion for missionary work. Alex was very compassionate and cared very much 
for people who had great need. Now it's Dorsonville and her child who are in great need. The two were kidnapped in Haiti Thursday from the campus of the faith-based ministry where Dorsonville serves as a nurse, according to the organization's website. Alex is married to the group's founder, Sandro Dorsonville. She spoke of her journey from New Hampshire to Haiti in a ministry video. Sandro invited me to come to the school to do some nursing for some of the kids. He said that was a big need that they had. We have very deep concern for the situation there, particularly with uh, regard to violence and the activities of, uh, of the gangs. No word yet on who may be holding the pair or if there's a ransom request. But increasing gang violence in Haiti only adds to the urgency of the situation. Dangerous conditions that didn't stop Alex from helping local Haitians through the ministry. Haitians are such a resilient people. They're full of joy and life and love. And I'm so blessed to be able to know so many amazing Haitians. The State Department confirms they are working with government partners and Haitian authorities to find Alex and her child and bring them back safely. I'm Laura Aguirre reporting. And hopefully they are able to find them and get them back as soon as possible and safely. The Idaho woman convicted of killing her two children and helping stage the death of her fifth husband's former wife learned her fate yesterday. Lori Vallow Daybell will spend the rest of her life behind bars. We're hearing from Vallow Daybell herself. Jonathan Bigliotti reports from the courthouse in St. Anthony, Idaho. Lori Daybell stared straight ahead as an Idaho judge imposed the maximum sentence allowed. That a mother killed her own children and you simply have no remorse for it. Daybell had been convicted of murdering two of her children, 16-year-old Tylee and 7-year-old JJ, and conspiring to kill Tammy Daybell before marrying Tammy's husband, Chad. In court, Daybell spoke out for the first time. Jesus Christ knows that no one was murdered in this case. Accidental deaths happen. It was rambling, bizarre, and disturbing. She claims the spirits of JJ and Tylee have reassured her. My children are happy. He put his arm around me and he said to me, you didn't do anything wrong, mom. Tylee came to me and she said to me, stop worrying, mom, we are fine. The judge was having none of it. You chose the most evil and destructive path possible. You justified all of this by going down a bizarre religious rabbit hole, and clearly you are still down there. Before sentencing, family members took direct aim at Daybell. Laura, you participated in the savage murders of precious people. I hope that the life you live is filled with fear. An outside court. We are done with Lori. She is no more to us. The arrogance to say what she said after she's done what she did I'm still at a loss for words for that. A prosecutor read a statement from Vallow Daybell's oldest son, Colby Ryan, who said he's lost his family and prays for healing for everyone involved, quote, including those who took the lives of everyone we loved. Vallow Daybell's attorney argued their client is misunderstood and that she is a loving mother who's caring, witty, insightful, and smart. A 68-year-old man turns himself in after, a six mi after six migrant workers got hit by an SUV in North Carolina. Police in Lincolnton, North Carolina, accused the man of purposefully running them over this past weekend. The driver told the officer he accidentally hit the gas when pulling into the parking spot and panicked. The vehicle appears to park before going forward, hitting the people and driving off. Police say he never stopped to check on those people. All victims were taken to the hospital but are expected to be okay. <laughs> We got a pit. We got a pit. A teenager in Arkansas is facing felony charges after a trooper used a pit maneuver on her car as she rushed her mom to the hospital. Dashboard camera showing how it all unfolded. Along with the twin teens, hands in the air, screaming, asking for help for their mother. The mom says she was having complications from a surgery she had, including her left arm going numb. Her daughter sped down I-630 with their hazard lights on for the hospital as she was telling her daughters to slow down for the authorities when they got hit. I'm just being apologetic, scared. I'm 18 years old. I don't know what to do. I've never been in this position. Never thinking I'm going to ever get hit by a state trooper. 
I'm thinking they're gonna help us. No help, just sad. Kenosha Moss was handcuffed and as troopers got to the car. She was later released and continued on to the hospital. The trooper issued her a felony citation for fleeing. In the report, he says he took action due to the traffic near the hospital. Moss pled not guilty and her trial date is set for September. One of the biggest trucking companies in the U.S., Yellow Trucking, is shutting down. It will affect 30,000 employees, including 20, 22,000 Teamsters employees. Yellow CEO blamed the union, who pushed back on that claim. The company's been around for 99 years, but ran into hard times in recent years. A lot of people are watching the developments when it comes to Yellow, because again, when you have a higher cost of transporting goods, many times a retailer, other companies, they want to pass those higher costs on to consumers. Last month, congressional investigators found Yellow should not have gotten $700 million in emergency funding during the pandemic. The Trump administration approved that loan in 2020, despite the Justice Department suing Yellow. At least two people were killed and six more wounded as Ukraine bombed a region occupied by Russia yesterday. The Russian installed leader of the partially occupied Donetsk said it was bombed multiple times. A bus was also destroyed in the attack as Ukraine continues to fight back against the invasion. A Georgia man who died as a prisoner of war in the Korean War is now identified as Georgia native Army Corporal Dewey Ruiz Jr. His remains are now in Georgia after more than 70 years thanks to a project using new DNA technology to identify remains. Ruiz's family says they're not upset that it took so long to identify remains. They're just happy that he's coming back home. It's, it's never too late to, 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 to find out about it. And so I would just say that it would give people hope that might have loved ones that, that they don't know their, where they, where, where, what, what happened to them. I'm only coordinating here. I am not the story. Dewey is the story. Rubis's family is donating his personal items to the local county historical society as a way for the next generation to remember the Korean War. The historical society honored to help preserve Rubis's memory. This is really the first time that we've been contacted to honor a soldier that has given his life uh, for our country. The funeral with full military honors is open to the public Saturday, August 12th, starting in Homerville and ending with his burial in Eccles County. It's one of the mysteries surrounding COVID. Some people suffer lingering symptoms of the virus weeks or even months after they were infected. The Biden administration is hoping researchers can find answers to the problem of long COVID. The White House is establishing a new office in the Department of Health and Humanitarian Services to lead that response. Up to 23 million people in the country are dealing with long COVID with symptoms that can affect nearly every part of the body. Striking actors on the picket lines are split on whether they agreed with the SAG-AFTRA interim agreements, which allow productions not affiliated with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers to resume if they agree to meet the union's requirements. Viola Davis announced over the weekend that she would be pausing production for an upcoming movie, despite getting an interim agreement to keep going. You know, we've gotten things lately that have shown that it's okay to work those. In the meantime, I'm actually, um, I was really impressed with Viola Davis. I love it that she's standing in solidarity. The Actors Union posted a message Sunday which read, in part, the interim agreement gives many of our journeymen, performers, and crews the opportunity to pay their rent and feed their families until they yield the deal we deserve. Buying a brand new car can be a real treat for some people. For new, new cars are supposed to offer a peace of mind when it comes to mechanical issues or other problems, but new cars these days may be more problematic than you think. Here's Gary Harper. Well, who doesn't like getting a brand new car? It comes with that new car warranty, and of course it has that new car smell. Everybody likes that. But a new report just released by J.D. Power says they're finding a significant number of complaints when it comes to new cars. J.D. Power surveyed consumers about everything from drivetrain issues and safety features to phone chargers and entertainment systems. And for two years running, they say that reported issues have grown significantly. We're at the most problematic that we've ever been for new vehicle quality. And Kristen Collage is with J.D. Power and tells On Your Side that many of the complaints are about basic parts of the car that have gotten more complex, 
like door handles, for example. Some automakers are making them flush with the door. Ergonomically, it's not working very well, right? It's not the right purchase um, position for someone's hand. It's tricky for kids to be able to utilize or passengers that aren't familiar with the vehicle. And auto manufacturers are trying to make cell phone usage inside your car safer and easier, but that's also causing some issues. The biggest growth in complaints is about wireless phone charging in the car, and drivers are pretty unhappy with some safety features like the system that warns you if you're drifting out of a lane. For the ones that have more of that beeping and chiming and are more on that conservative nature, those are the ones that are becoming more problematic, and then we're seeing in certain instances, customers turning those features off. Overall, J.D. Power found an average of 192 problems for every 100 cars. And the biggest offenders? Electric automakers. Tesla had 257 problems for every 100 cars. Polestar had 313. And this is the manufacturers in certain cases innovating and that level of innovation and what's being presented is posing new problems. It's posing new ergonomic challenges. It's more, you know, less familiar to the user. The best brand overall, Dodge. It only had 140 problems per 100 vehicles. And the best premium brand may surprise you. Alfa Romeo hasn't always had the best reputation, but it only had 143 problems, much better than brands like Cadillac, BMW or Mercedes-Benz. According to J.D. Power, car manufacturers are coming up with a lot more features that consumers seem to really be liking, but at this point there's some bugs that need to be worked out. I'm Gary Harper. A recent Bankrate.com survey found younger Americans are saving less for emergencies because of inflation compared to Generation X and boomers. Consumer investigator Rachel DePompa talks to people behind that survey and gets advice on what you can do in this watching your wallet. We're often told inflation impacts older generations more than younger generations, likely because older Americans may be on a fixed income or already in retirement and no longer earning money. But a recent survey from Bankrate.com found an overwhelming number of younger Americans struggling to set aside money for emergencies because of the higher prices. Sarah Foster is a principal writer for Bankrate.com. She says this is a time for younger Americans to be more mindful of how much they're spending and to hyperanalyze their budgets. The ultimate goal is to make sure that you're living within your means. She also says there are several advantages to being young right now, especially when it comes to your retirement contributions. Really the best way to gain wealth and beat inflation in the long run is to make sure that you're holding a diverse portfolio of assets, including stocks. And so we know that even if someone were to stop investing for three years because of inflation in their, in their uh, mid-20s, they'd leave almost $200,000 on the table by the time they were 70. Foster says don't stop your retirement contributions during inflation. She says another reason younger Americans are being hit hard is they are early in their careers and haven't reached their peak earnings, which is why anytime you get a raise, Foster says put that extra money in your savings account or retirement account. With this Watching Your Wallet, I'm Rachel DePompa. Chances are you have a smart TV and those televisions already support streaming services, but you may want more options and you may want a streaming device. Our consumer tech reporter Jamie Tucker takes a look at all of them to help you decide which one's best for you. So what is the best streaming device? Roku, Fire Stick, Chromecast, or Apple TV? The answer is different for different people. I've used all of them and here's what you need to know before you pick one. If cost is important, Apple TV is out at $129. The rest are around $30 for standard HD. Streaming devices that display 4K are around 50 bucks. Best for Amazon users, Amazon Fire Stick. The interface is easy to use, but Amazon Prime video content is front and center. While you can watch Netflix and Hulu and other services, you'll need to dive a little deeper into the menu. A Roku offers multiple devices that plug into the TV. Some sit beside it. Roku also has the Stream Bar, a solid speaker to enhance audio, and its streaming player is built in. The interface is simple, but isn't great. Rather than seeing titles and suggestions, you choose which channel to browse. So it takes some time switching from one service to the other. But the Roku has a wider selection of channels and services. 
It has its own free Roku channel. A Google has its Chromecast with Google TV. This one is best if you just want to turn on the television and see everything that's available. The interface is intuitive, displaying on the home screen shows and movies you'll probably like based on what you watched before. But I suggest you pick one, and here's why. All of these devices gather and share your information with other companies. So by picking just one brand for all of your TVs, you're limiting the number of companies getting access to your information. That's What the Tech. I'm Jamie Tucker. And if you're looking for a streaming device, keep this in mind. Amazon does not sell Chromecast devices, and Walmart does not sell the Amazon Fire Stick. Okay, take a look at this. We told you about a couple middle schoolers in Aiken County who were heading to the World Bass Fishing, Cha Bass Fishing Championship. Turns out they placed seventh in the nation out of 52 boats. 13-year-old Gage and 11-year-old Braxton fished for four days in a row in temperatures over 100 degrees. Here are some of those pictures from their big catches at the lake. Their captain, Raymond Bailey, was in the water with them every day to help guide them through their challenges. So congratulations to them. Some good-sized fish they caught out there. Six months ago, the Georgia High School Association announced a three-year deal that would bring the football state championships back to Mercedes-Benz. The South Carolina High School League is following suit. This season, the league will host all five state finals at SC State. As Alyssa Lyons tells us, there's more than just a title at risk. The South Carolina High School League is moving the game, the one every football team works for and every fan hopes to buy a ticket to. I look at it, we'll go anywhere. We'll play, we'll play on I-20. We'll go to Dillon, we'll go to Hilton Head, we'll go to Seneca, get a state championship game. We'll go to any part of the state, doesn't matter where we play the game. Uh, we just want to get there. There is now here at South Carolina State, home of the Bulldogs. It's a bigger venue than Benedict. South Carolina State hosted the 1A games back in the early 2000s when they had two championships and things were good then. Before all games were played at Benedict, some finals were played at williams Bryce Stadium. And it cost as good as it looked. Unfortunately, if you play at a big venue like that, and you don't make enough money to cover the cost. The schools have to come out of pocket to play in the state championship game. In South Carolina, where they've had it at williams Bryce, the security is the largest cost there, and it costs way more than the ticket sales. Smith is also a board member for the South Carolina Football Coaches Association. State games are more than just bragging rights. I can, I can tell you this, in 2019, Ridge Spring played in the state championship, and Barnwell both played in the state championship. My last two stops, I was there in 2019, both schools got checks for about $15,000 back from that game. Sometimes winning just comes at a cost. Alyssa Lyons on your side. The town will also host the Dixie Youth Baseball World Series next summer. Teams from 11 southeast states will make their way to the Orangeburg Recreation Park next July. So some big things coming to Orangeburg. Okay, let's keep it with sports here, talking about football coming back here pretty soon. Ed Booth headed out to Thompson to catch up with the Bulldogs as they look to defend their Class 2A state title. Good morning, everyone. The defending Class 2A state champion Thompson Bulldogs are hard at work coming off their first state title in 20 years, and they're preparing to get everyone's best shot this season. <laughs> you're the target now. Everybody want to beat you because you're the defending state champs, and every time you get on the field, Everybody wants a piece of you. Uh, yeah, we did it, but that's last year. This is a whole different year. That means we got to go out here and put in a whole different type of energy, a whole different type of work ethic. Finding that hunger, that motivation, and that drive after winning it all is easier said than done. That mentality is something head coach Michael Youngblood has been establishing with this year's team since day one. You make it to the mountaintop, but do you want to stay there? And that's the first question I asked our kids when we came back. Do you want to do this again? Because if you don't, let me know so I'll know how to coach you. Got to be killers. We got to do everything, do everything right. Got to do it once. Everybody come for us. Everybody want to say they beat the state champs. Going on a long playoff run is valuable experience for all of the returning players. People are like, man, ain't no, ain't no championship coming back to the team. But last year, with God allowing us to do what we did, it showed that it can be done. So I feel like it set the standard for this year. Especially for those who are stepping into bigger roles this year with seniors like star running back Jontavius Curry moving on to the college ranks. We got some guys that's going to have to step up and, and replace some of those seniors that we have missing and you know we got a good nucleus of kids that know how to get it done and know what to do so we're relying on their leadership to push us forward. We're here. We're not no slouches. We really put work in all my brothers and everything. 
The Thompson Bulldogs will start their state championship defense on the road against Burke County, the only team that found a way to beat the Bulldogs last season. After playing the first three years of his high school career at Grovetown, Darion Reed has decided to transfer. Reed is ranked at number 15 on ESPN's top 100 list for the best prospects in the class of 2024. Next season, Reed will be taking his talents to California to play his senior season for Prolific Prep, a school that has a history of producing NBA prospects on a yearly basis. Darion's mother, Marie Reed, took to Facebook saying in part, Grovetown High School will always be their home. The soon to be senior balled out at Peach Jam and was a member of Grove Town's 2022 Class 6A state championship winning team. That's it for sports. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for that, Dan. Great for Darion going out to California to uh, pursue some high level basketball out there. Bummer for us, though, man. He was a fun player to watch uh, and, of course, a state champion, like you mentioned, back in uh, 2022. Okay, let's uh, finish it up here with one more story. Off Highway 272 in Washington County lies a bizarre piece of history tucked away in the trees. Our Will Volk has the history behind the pig monument. Never know what you could find on the side of the road. For example, look at what this says, pig monument. There's lots and lots of stories. This of the pig monument is one of the excellent examples. William Rawlings wrote several books about Washington County history. He walked through the brush to tell us all about the history of the Pig Monument. It goes back 90 years to 1933 and the Great Depression. Times were very hard here in Georgia. People were short of money, short of everything. Uh, some people were almost starving. For local farmer Bartow Barron, that was a real concern. His one pig, the meat for his winter, disappeared. He found it at the bottom of a 40-foot well. He decided to fill up the well, shovel by shovel, and gradually raise the pig up to the top. His neighbors saw what he was doing. They were all in the same boat. They were all suffering, and they realized that in order to be successful, in order to pull through this period of deprivation, they had to work together. Working together, they rescued the pig. It showed the spirit of the community in pulling together for, for good. That's why all these years later, this monumental act is honored by a monument. In Washington County, Will Volt, on your side. For the humans, that's a success story. For the pig, not so much. Uh, in the long run, didn't really work out for him. You can read the, or you can find the monument near Oconee, Georgia. It can be tough to find, so we have the exact address up on our website, wrdw.com. Again, you can find all these stories and much more up on the website. Be sure to download our streaming app on your favorite streaming device. Uh, also, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, WRDW News 12. We do have our new First Alert Weather Extra show coming up here at about 1030. I'll be joined by Mikkel Hannah Harding and Emily Acton, our First Alert meteorologists, to talk weather from around the region and around the country. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you back here then.